Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all so much for your patience and uh, for being here to, for tonight's, I think, very important event. Important event for the library, important event for all of us who are here, important event for the community. I do want to mention a couple of upcoming uh, programs at the library. Uh, we're, we're very pleased uh, to have a uh, native uh, daughter of Kansas City, Jean Drews, will be uh, here at the Plaza Library on uh, uh, June 13th. Uh, she is the head archivist, preservation archivist at the Library of Congress, a graduate of UMKC uh, across the street, and uh, uh, a very special person. And, and she'll be talking about what's special about special collections and talking to a librarian. They're all special, I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> And then in, in our, our, our quest uh, for, uh, for, for an endless uh, immersion in Shakespeare, um, uh, which I think over the last couple of years we've pretty well done, uh, we, we have invited researcher Dennis McCarthy uh, here uh, to talk about uncovering Shakespeare's inspiration uh, in the find of a lifetime. Shakespeareans worldwide were electrified earlier this year by the announced discovery of a previously unknown source or inspiration for the many works of William Shakespeare. You will hear it here first. Uh, and that will be on June 26th here at the Plaza uh, Library. And on June 27th, also here at the Plaza, uh, we have uh, a part of our ongoing series about eviction and about what works in making, uh, making a, a city a great uh, uh, and fair city. Uh, and uh, I uh, urge you to be here. We'll, we'll be working with KCPT uh, on this. Uh, they've been, as you know, been doing a series on, on housing and, and eviction. I think it's very important work. Um, uh, we, you may have noticed something we're doing that's brand new out in the hall. We have what's called a dip jar. For those of you who cannot write us the million dollar check that you would like to to keep this programming going on, there's a jar you can dip your credit card into that will take $5 off your, off your credit card to support our programming. I would urge you to dip, thank you. Um, and, and help us keep this great uh, programming going. Uh, in other months, we may use the dip jar to support our, our youth programming uh, uh, or fix our parking lots. Um, but right now, it's uh, for supporting uh, our programming and throughout the month, uh, it will be. Um, also, I wanna now introduce uh, uh, the sponsor of tonight's uh, program. The Friends of the Library are a sponsor, and they've been a great sponsor throughout the years. I hope you all, I'm sure you all are already members of the Friends. $35 is all it costs, uh, but Matt Sterling, uh, the president of the Friends, is here uh, for a little message uh, about them. The telling of stories like Sonia's and, and her wit bearing witness to history are so important to all of us. And, and so I want to thank all of you for being here tonight to, to hear her tell her story. Uh, as Crosby said, my name is Matt Sterling, and I'm president of the Friends of the Kansas City Public Library. The Friends, if you're not familiar, we're an organization dedicated to supporting the library through advocacy, outreach, and some financial help as well. So the idea actually for tonight's event came from, from one of our Friends board members, Renee Franklin. Uh, it was a great idea. The, the Friends took Renee's idea. We worked with the library and their wonderful staff uh, to make tonight happen. And, and as Crosby said, we're, we're, the Friends are very proud to be sponsoring tonight's event. Uh, in fact, uh, my wife uh, has, has brought our one and a half week old son here tonight. Uh, Because we think it's important when he's older to be able to talk to him about what you're all going to hear tonight, and we can tell him that he was here as well. Uh, I also wanted to mention that the, the friends are donating uh, 10 copies of two titles that are inspired by Sonia's life to the Reading Club book bags uh, that are available to library patrons. And those are going to be Inventing Joy, Dare to Build a Brave and Creative Life by Joy Morgan, Mangan, excuse me, and Les Parisiennes, How the Women of Paris Lived, Loved, and Died Under Nazi Occupation by Anne Seba. And as Crosby alluded, your support of the Friends and your Kansas City Public Library helps make sure events like tonight happen. If you're not a friend of the library, please consider joining for as little as $25 a year. 
Also consider, consider making a donation using those dip jars that Crosby mentioned. It only takes a second to dip your credit card in and your $5 donation will help support library public programming. And we're gonna have those available in the library so all month, so if you ever come to the library and you see them, just $5, that helps make sure things like tonight happen. Uh, so if you have any questions afterwards about how you join the Friends or, or how you could get involved, we have a table you might have seen out by, by the refreshments outside. Please come by, have a chat with us. We're happy to talk. Uh, so I'll, I'll cut it off there. We'll get to what we're really here for tonight. Uh, Sonia and Crosby, thank you all. Thanks so much, Matt, and thanks very much to the Friends of the Library as our, our sponsor. Um, before I bring uh, our, our great uh, survivor, witness, and now movie star uh, out, I do want to mention there is another uh, survivor uh, and witness, and it, 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 there's also a movie involved uh, in the audience tonight. I thank Gitla Doppelt. Gitla, are you here? Down, down here in front. And, <laughs> Some of you will have seen the movie Defiance, uh, starring Daniel Craig, which is in part about her family uh, and their experience uh, during the war. Um, so now, ladies and, and gentlemen, uh, the very big star of the evening, uh, the star of Big Sonya and great witness and survivor, ladies and gentlemen, Sonya Warshawski. So last year, your, your granddaughter finished a, uh, uh, a multi-year effort uh, in, uh, re and released a movie about your life. It opened at the Glenwood Theater in Overland Park for what was to be a short run. It ran for six months. 25,000 people saw it. Uh, we showed it here at the, at the, at the Plaza Library uh, uh, in a fundraiser for reaching out from within, which we can talk about in a little bit. Um, it's gone to Los Angeles and New York and around the world at film festivals. It's won nine awards. Um, it must be startling to be a film star uh, later on in your experience. So what, what, is it, what is it like, what does it mean to you to, uh, to have this experience? Well, <clears throat> it's almost really unbelievable to me. It's like a dream because when they started, I did never realize they will go that f big, you know, farther. Because uh, to me, I, uh, I thought that it's going to be just for, uh, for the family, they're going to be doing a little film. But, uh, <laughs> but later when I noticed they were coming back and forth, and, and I said, well, I feel it's going a little larger than I think. So I asked my daughter, Regina, and she said, you know, mom, don't say anything. They want to go a little bigger. And uh, this is their, you know, um, a labor of love. So I went with it. And I never asked too much, but I have noticed it is going to be bigger than just for the family. <laughs> well, it obviously, it was a labor of love and, and, and a family project. And, and, and it's in, in many ways, it's a movie not just about you, but about your family and about the, Absolutely. the impact Absolutely. Uh, about your, your original family and, 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 and your, 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 your children, grandchildren, et cetera. But I want to take you back to, uh, to your hometown in, in Poland. And I'm, I've been trying to to pronounce it correctly in the uh, Polish pronunciation, the Yiddish pronunciation. Yes, in Polish, Mienzyrzec Podlaski. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On the map. And, and then uh, in Jewish, in our language, we call that Mezrich. Mezrich is a little easier, so I'm going to call it yeah, Mezrich from Mezrich. this yeah. point forward. Um, your father was a, a furrier. You had a nice uh, middle class, upper middle class upbringing. Yes. Um, it, it, it was, it, I've seen pictures of the town. It seems like a, a pretty town, a beautiful town. Yes. What was your growing up like? 
Was it a, a happy? Well, really, uh, before the war, it was a normal life. I had very loving, you know, parents. We were three children. And uh, for some reason, I was attending the public school because my parents felt that, you know, to be mixed with other, you know, uh, beliefs. <laughs> and um, so there really, it was a very industrial city, by the way. Industrial Me city? Yeah, Mezrich yeah. was really very well known all over the world, believe it or not. We were very famous of our factories of bristle brushes. Now you have nylon, but uh, to yeah, matter of fact, this is one. This is really a hundred years old, I want you to know. When I came, to, how I have it, when I came to this country, I had an aunt in Chicago. And the story goes, my aunt was always helping, you know, out. My grandma had a little, you know, um, <clears throat> restaurant. And um, my grandpa passed away very early. So her daughters were helping her. And the, my, the family in Chicago, my um, aunt, always used to send them money and helping with, you know, with different things, clothes and so on. So for reciprocation, my aunt sent a package to my uh, aunt, and in that package was this little brush, you can imagine. It's at least 100 years old. But uh, like I say again, the bristle, uh, as you see, is very now very expensive because it's a lot, a lot of, it goes through a lot of work, chemicals and so on, until it's you're able to make the brushes. So this, some, it might not have been idyllic, but this lovely little town, 18,000 uh, Jews in the population, yes. uh, uh, the war starts, and it essentially eventually becomes a prison, a prison for you and your family and, and for the other, other Jewish families exactly. with attempts to escape, including your father and, and, and your older brother. Our city went through a really hard time. As you remember, when Hitler made his uh, first pact with, uh, with Stalin, I come from the eastern part of Poland, closer to Belarus in the Ukraine. And um, when he made this uh, pact, our town fell into the Russians. Later on, Hitler changed the pact, and our... Uh, um, our uh, city fell in back to the Germans. So you can imagine what really it's, it started with the SS. When the, um, I would tell you, when the army comes in, you, they, they didn't do those horrible things. After, you know, um, maybe a month or so, then the SS comes in and they start to do those horrible, horrible things to us. And, and, and there are a series of roundups. Roundups. We had um, supposedly six roundups. And I tell you, since our city had a uh, station, not every little town had stations. So they started, for example, to clean up no more Jews in the smaller, you know, towns. And they would. They couldn't do in one time to send them to the guest chamber, or uh, so they would send them to our city. And so they, we had a ghetto, and, um, and then some would go to the, the guest chamber. To, uh, the closest from us was Treblinka. I don't know how many you know. Those are, you, you have to keep in mind, please, that the eastern part in Poland had the most deadliest camps and death camps. And we are surrounded, you know, when I look now in the map, I didn't realize how many. And Treblinka was one of them. And most, you know, from the Warsaw Ghetto, from my hometown, we wind up in Treblinka. And Treblinka, you went, that's it, you could never, you know, this is it. So you're, you're 
your family was trying to escape. Your your sister, your little sister, uh, uh, tried to escape. Um, when when they took us out, in the hiding on the last, you know, before the last, you know, roundup, and they came this time. We had a little hiding under the bed. We had only one room, in the, in the ghetto, and we were still lucky with that. So you can imagine. This time they came with German shepherds, and they sniffed us out from the hiding. So when they took us outside, and we were had to kneel against the wall, we thought right that we will be killed right on the spot there. And uh, especially my youngest little sister, she really, she really int went into a shock. So anyway, I cannot speak too long. My father was sitting next to her, and he pushed her back, you know, to the place where they took us out. In the meanwhile, they were rounding up other Jewish people from other places, and then we had to finally, in the end, to stand up to walk. And that minute, when we stood up, my father managed to escape. So me and my mom wind up. You know, on the city square. In the city square, they took us to the trains, to the cattle trains. And this, I still never forget. It was May the third, 1943, because May the third was my brother's birthday. That's the reason I remember so vividly. So me and my mom, we wind up, you know, on the way to the. And the first camp was um, well. On the way, when they took us, they put us in the, cat, the cattle trains. We could not even move. It's like we were like squeezed like herrings, and people were dying from thirst. And on the top, literally of, dying. Yeah. They were literally dying from thirst. Yes. So there were dead bodies in your Absolutely. car. Absolutely. I was luckily, it's, uh, like I say, we cannot speak too long. I was wearing boots and I had some, you know, money in it. And I managed to stand up on a dead body to reach this little tiny, you know, wired little open little little window. And I put out the money, and some of the men, the, from the Polish uh, men working in the station, and he handed over to me. I'll never forget a, a little canteen with water. When I got this little canteen, I took a sip. And I still, till today, I don't remember if my mama managed, because you know, to get a seat. Because people became like wild. Everyone wanted, you know, to get a, a sip of the water. You can imagine there were children, babies, elderly people, and it was a horrible thing. And and telling you, dying from thirst is the worst way of dying. And so you, 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 you survive and your mother survives the, the experience we, of this cattle car. Yeah, from the cattle car, we were going to Treblinka. And we knew we were going to, our, to die. And suddenly, we didn't know at that moment what happened, that the train stopped. And this is the reason I'm telling you I got a little water. And then, finally, we felt that our train was derailing. And we arrived in, um, to Majdanek. This was a concentration camp. They had only one guest chamber and one crematoria. And um, what can I tell you? It was a horrible camp. And so close over the, through the, you know, uh, <coughs> the road, you could see people, you know, living and, you know, uh, you could see Houses. Right. Lublin was a very big city, right. yes. So they knew they could see. And, um, and, um, and all this time your mother was with you. She was yes. trying to take when care we of you. Yeah, when we stepped down, stepped out from the train, they performed a selection. The selection for the first time we finally got to know what it means left and right. And uh, the SS was still whoever was still, you know, alive, and a lot already were dead people. So we, me and my mom, we fold into the right, 
and to the to the camp, and the others went up in the guest and, chamber. And one of, one of the people you 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 said who was uh, dividing uh, the prisoners up uh, was was Joseph Mengele. Yeah, all the infamous. Uh, yes, Mengele. I don't know how many of you know who was Joseph Mengele. Je I'm sure. The I evil hope. doctor who experiment, yes. experimented. He was doing experiments on us, and especially his specialty was the twins and the short little people, you know, midgets, and our young people, of course. And um, I must tell you, in this camp, I lost my mom. One day, Mengele came, because really his hub was Auschwitz-Birkenau. For what reason? He came to perform this election, I'll never know. And we came, it was almost, you know, the time when, um, well, like I say again, we don't have enough time that I can tell you what I have seen in their hangings and so on. So I have to go on a little faster and tell you how I lost my mom. So one day it was already uh, almost, I would say, the time when you, everything ripens on the fields. Mengele came to perform this selection. During the day, we had to go through all naked, and we came in front of him. He put my mom to the left and me to the right. And I would like to tell you, I was ready to go with her, but they pushed the, the cess woman was just bidding me push me away back to the right. Um, I have to point it out to you. In this camp, when we came in, uh, to Majdanek, they did not have latrines. They had only, you know, just big digged up, you know, some holes, so you can imagine. And um, what can I tell you? I was testifying in this camp, was especially a horrible, saddest, a woman, which being a woman, you would never believe that somebody can be so, so uh, sadistic. I was testifying after the war, in it, and I have to, can I say about a little bit? Yes. yes. She was always walking with three German shepherds and a whip. She was tall, we had a special name for her. And let me tell you, if she caught you some days that you know that you didn't walk out to, to the fields or whatever to work, she would dump those girls, those women, to those, you know, holes to death. She would also, we were counted twice a day in each camp, the same, you know, routine. And she would go also while we were counting. And if you didn't stand up straight, I always try to be in the middle or on the end, because we always count them fives. And if she didn't, she would put the German shepherds on you. Yes, it's a, it was a horrible thing. And uh, I will not, I don't have time to tell you about the hangings, what took place there, because we'll have to go further. But only I want to mention about my mom. So after the selection, the ones where they were lined up on the left, they kept them on the same field. I have to explain to you that each camp had fields, fields one, two, and so on and so on. And uh, the ones where they were like me to the right, they took us to another field. And right in very early in the morning, when we knew here sirens, we knew that something's going on that they want to see us. That they call it in the German Blocksperre. You cannot go out, you cannot come in. It's like God wants me to see my mom for the last time. I would push myself to the big door from the barrack, and thanks goodness, there was just a little small peephole. And believe it or not, I looked out, and I saw my mother walking in all with the other women. I still even remember she was holding on to another lady from my hometown, I recognize. This was the last time I have seen mom, my mom. The next morning we wind up in Birkenau, Auschwitz, yes. So, it, and she, um, I want to mention to you to know that my mother at that time, I told her she's an older lady, she was not even 43.
Yes. When I reached that age, you can imagine how I felt. So, in, 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 they take you off to, to Auschwitz, Birkenau? Uh, when we arrived in Birkenau, Auschwitz, we did not go through a selection because he selected us already in the Majdanek. So we were assigned to certain barracks. Some of the barracks were just, you know, in the beginning we were just, they used us to carry, you know, big stones from one place to another. You could, you could know that this is, they want you to die. We were performing, you know, all kind of labor work, which men would, you know, would be even too, you know, heavy. And then later they um, put us in different barracks, and I li wind up in a barrack which was very close from one of the crematoriums in the gas chambers. I would like to let you know, when I came to, to Auschwitz-Birkenau, I walked from Auschwitz to Birkenau. Later on, they built a train to go in faster to the crematoria to kill the people. And I happened to be in a barrack which was very close from the crematoria and the gas chamber. So you can imagine what I heard, the noises and so on. And many times also, again, the block sparrows we knew we could see the people walking to the gas chambers. And many times we would come from outside from the work and they would, not only they didn't walk, they ran them just like cattle, to, and they would ask us, where are we going, where are we going? And here you see, you know, men, young and old and women, babies, and, and you want to tell them you're going to your death, but it wouldn't help, what's the use? No one could go against it. And it, it was, in Birkenau Auschwitz especially, it was just being like in hell, because you was exposed any, any minute you'll be maybe next to the crematoria, to the guest chamber. I, am, I have to tell you that God gave us not only six cents, but higher than, and if I wouldn't have used, when I go back and thinking about it, my sixth sense, I wouldn't have been here. I got two tremendous, terrible beatings twice. Once two teeth were, you know, falling out from my, the beating. I cannot go on and tell you because I know I will. <laughs> it will be too long. <laughs> but, and, and, and you said in the past, you, you, there were moments when you were, you were ill. And, and of course, the selection process is always about weeding out the... Exactly. The you never knew when the selection can, you know, take place. Sometimes the selection would be like, like I mentioned to you, in the counting in the morning, and he'll come tower. I still remember a tall guy, really also a killer, and he had with him a lady from, you know, like a, you would call it a secretary, and she, he would go through, you know, the you know, uh, like we were counted and looked at you. All he did, took your number and she would put it on the, on the paper, okay? And sometimes would take like a week, two weeks, until again you hear a block sparrow, you knew again something, and sure enough, you can imagine, I don't think so anyone, any one of you can imagine, they would come in inside and call off the numbers of those women were they going to their dead. It was horrible. Sometimes sisters. It happens all from my hometown, there were two sisters, and one was on the list. And their cries and their shrieks, it was unbelievable. You have to keep in mind that, that Hitler had almost whole Europe. We had even women from Greece so you can imagine the women from Greece, especially the the climate, was such a such a big difference. They couldn't they couldn't make it. And one day I was working, which was a happy day for me, coming into a that we're supposed to go and clean up where the SS was living. Why I'm saying a happy day? If you found a pill from a potato 
even from up, oh my gosh, she made a day. And suddenly doing it, we hear terrible cries. And here, you know, the barracks were in between. You could see, you know, they were not too close. And sure enough, I shall never forget as long as I live. All naked were standing all those Greek women and going, they knew they were going to the crematoria. And their cries and shrieks, you cannot forget as long you live. One day I worked there very close in a meadow close from one of the crematorias. And suddenly, it was early spring, we saw two, I'll never forget, two open trucks. Finally, later we got, we found out uh, this was a very industrial, most industrial city in Poland. Lodz was the name. And they kept it, this was the last one when they made it already, you didn't rain, no more Jews. And they, those two little trucks open. From far, it looked like to me, like little white geese. When they approached it a little closer to the crematoria, there was little tiny, tiny children. They all were wearing white little shirts, I'll never forget. And then after 15, 20 minutes, whatever, you see them, you know, you see that terrible smoke. It was not a usual smoke. I wrote a few poems and I hope that was enough that someone, one of my poems could see that I write about it. It was really unbelievable. It's in the 20th century. Right. And this was Germany and Austria, the highest, civilized highest culture. Yes. Yeah. And, and so Hitler controls Europe and, and you're, you've seen your mother, you've seen your your, 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 your father and brother go not knowing what happened to them and your sister and you know what happened to your mother and this horrible, horrible experience. How did you keep your spirit up? I mean, what, what kept you alive? In, in, uh, I asked this many times myself. It is all very probably difficult for all of you to grasp. It is, you feel like you're in a hell. It was very easy to commit suicide. Yeah, you saw many people. Oh, so many, suicide. yeah, every morning, especially around, uh, you know, um, um, after the summer, how do you call it? The, um, fall, winter. Fall, thank fall. you. In the fall, especially. Women, most I would have to tell you, the women from a higher, you know, background in their country, it's like France and um, Belgium, Holland, they couldn't make it. And then every morning we had a lot, a lot of suicides. I would say the Polish, you know, women were more hardened because the climate, we could take it better, even the winter and the snow. But all they had, you had to do is just put one finger, two fingers on the electric wiring. It was, that's it. But I refused. I fought to survive in every way, and it really would take many, many hours to tell you. And um, how many, how three times I went through selection through Mengele. Like I say again, you never knew where the selection would take place. Sometimes we would come out from the, you know, in the evening from the uh, work outside. And right away, if you saw, you know, you were around that, yeah, you knew you were going to a selection. And I can tell you, I escaped three, three selections. Two, I escaped by hiding, and I cannot, we don't have the time to tell you. But the last one, there was no way I could, you know, escape from it. And the selection usually was uh, performed where they uh, usually used to take the, um, uh, the showers, and it was a very, very big building. They would bring you in from, let's say, there is the door, and there is a door. And Mengele always stood on the side, okay? And he did the selection. I'll never forget this man. He was short. He looked always like coming out from a shower. White gloves in a stick, and he was selecting with a stick. So the ones what they had selected to left, they were still in the same building, 
And then once to the right, it means you go back, you know, to your barracks, he let you out in the other door. So you can imagine, I felt that I will not make it. I was already bony, and I was no way. So I just start, you know, drinking my, you know, skin, like, you know, I'm still looking, you know, <laughs> healthier. And I can tell you, when I approach them, he holds me back. He holds me back and he asks me how old I am. And I cannot tell you, until today, I only remember I told them I'm younger. For some reason, I don't know. And he let me through. And then on the end, you know, you, the Russians uh, were liberated. Right. Uh, so, yeah. you, so they drive you out of uh, Auschwitz. Uh, exactly. Because the Russians are, are, are coming. Yes. They march you. Uh, all the camp, from all the camps around. I still don't understand. They knew already they're losing the war. And still whoever was able still to walk, you, they, they call it now in the history, the uh, death march, you call it. The right. death march. Right. And I can tell you, the death march wasn't like a death march. We were not, you know, oh, before the, we uh, went, whoever was able still, and uh, they gave us one blanket, and um, I still remember a little can of horse meat, and the water was the, the, the snow. Right. They were running us like cattle, and the bullets over us constantly, constantly. And it's so much to tell you, I'm sorry, I, I know the time is getting... Sure, but eventually you get to Bergen-Belsen through Dachau, so you've been in Meidenek, Not Auschwitz, right away, Bergen, but Dachau, yes. in and open, up... excuse me, I want to point it out. In the winter, they put us on open cattle trains. In the summer was the closed ones. And I really don't know, uh, I should mention, if you know, that also the Ukrainians and the Latvians right. joined the uh, Hitler. Right. Yes. And they mostly were also on the eastern side. In the western side of Poland, they didn't uh, notice too many. And they were even worse sometimes. I'm sorry to say. It doesn't mean that all of them were like this. But anyway, when um, Bergen. finally, finally, in the open trains, you can imagine, we lost so many women because of the, co of the, you know, it was winter, you can imagine, and uh, we all we were just closing to each other to keep, you know, warm, and uh, quite a few were, were dying, yeah. Until finally, finally, we arrived in front of Dachau, and there is a, was a segregation, so many women came, went to different camps, and I fell in to Bergen-Belsen. And, and, and so in Bergen-Belsen, we're now getting to the end of the war. And, and, and though they're, it's unspeakable in Bergen-Belsen, too, and, and in part because they are losing the war. There's no food. There's no, no... It was unbelievable. As I mentioned to you, that Hitler did not put gas chambers on his soil. Bergen-Belsen was in Germany. And they had only one crematoria. So you can imagine, people were dying by the thousands and thousands every day. One crematoria could not do the job. So you can imagine the piles, the piles of the dead people. It was a horrible, horrible camp. When it was liberated, they, they, they I was said, liberated. Yes. You, uh, 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 um, they said they couldn't tell the living from the dead. And on Liberation Day, April 15th, 1945, they're, they're coming, you're about to be liberated, and what happens to you? I was working in a <coughs> peeling room, you, uh, what do you call it, like a barn. That barn was connected to the kitchen. In the kitchen, you know, uh, first also I want to mention to you that all in every camp, the rations were about the same. We were getting two slices of bread, a small little piece of margarine, and sometimes a little something like a jello. And um, in the morning, only hot water, not in every camp, because in Majdanek they had only um, 
outside well and you had to fetch the water right in the morning to anyway and um, and then when you worked in the fields wherever you worked they would bring you uh, it's a soup which uh, water and just some kind of leaves this was our you know uh, ration of the whole day so you can imagine and um, so liberation day the liberation day the liberation day since you know um, I was working in that you know peeling you know uh, barn not potatoes it was mostly that time they had uh, ruda bakers and in the front of the barn they had quite you know those ruda bakers you know uh, and they always had one uh, German um, who watched you know the the ruda bakers yes and um, so you can imagine one day I shall never forget you noticed something is different first of all you didn't see that many SS women and the SS men what they usually in go into the kitchen so you had a feeling something is going on and finally I was so curious I went to the latrine was outside and while I wish I would have been but something have to happen it happened and I could see from far far away it was a very big big you know uh, camp Bergen Belsen and what do you think I could hear already that like tanks are coming and I want to share it the news and while I was running in to tell the girls what I see already the men's camp was across and you don't know what hunger can bring matter of fact they had also some of the Russian soldiers what they wind up on the German and they were there and um, it was there what you call it um, it took like livers you know you my, uh, how do you call it uh, it's the, the what from the dead people before they died with the livers and they used you know the hunger was I, horrible they're, they're cannibalism they're yeah that's right. it was horrible yes yeah, it was a horrible thing yeah. so anyway so as soon as they already noticed too from far and they could hear the all the the tanks where does the hungry run they all start running to the kitchen or to the you know to just to grasp even those dirt with the dirt those ruder bakers and he was still standing sh shooting he was shooting from a very short when I got here you know uh, when I was shot I really didn't know what happened to me at the moment but my luck was if he would have shot me from farther I wouldn't have made it but he shot me from very short distance that the bullet came in here came out through here and two other girls were wounded so you can imagine in that moment I have to tell you I didn't know what was happening to me as finally I, the blood was coming out of my mouth and I said oh my god I was even you know swallowing the blood and talking to the Almighty after what I went through and now I have to perish I could not accept this finally one from the, the you know the Russian, Russian fellow POW. yeah picked me up and he thought you know to f before I die already outside the English had a very hard time because the whole the whole camp was you know with the horrible uh, 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 typhus and, uh, and they were scared themselves and uh, so you can imagine when he picks me up and he tells me before I die to see outside already the English had all the uh, assess women and by the way all the assess women what well, they took the pictures little pictures and then finally I, I'll tell you later about it anyway and then also 
all the men, you know, and Kramer, he was in charge of uh, Bergen Belsen, yes, the, yeah, the assessment. And I saw them all, you know, holding up their hands. Their hands up. And that's what he was telling me before I died to see the, the liberation. liberation before yeah. you die, but we know On the first, die. the first evening, they put us just in a, on the floor, it was an empty barrack, I'll never forget, all the ones who were there wounded. And what can I tell you? If not the English, I would English be English doctor. <laughs> yeah, the doctors. Did you? Yeah. And, yeah. and here you are. Now, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. Yes, through yeah, your, I know. Through the quiet part of your life, I don't imagine you ever really had a completely quiet part of your life, but um, you meet your husband, the My, tailor. Yeah, he was also in uh, one of the... Uh, yeah. Yes, two weeks. If they would come in two weeks later, he wouldn't have made it. And by the way, the... Um, uh, you know, from Holland, uh, uh, what is her name? She survived. Anne, Anne Frank died Anne there. Frank, yeah. She died only like a week or two weeks before the liberation. Body was, her body was still... Yeah, her uh, cousin made it. She was with a cousin there. So that looks like that she was also with me on the death march. She had to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. I don't know if she had a number because she came much, much later, yeah. So you've had this unbelievable, unfathomably dark experience to meet your husband, you have a family, you move to, the, to yes. Kansas City, um, and uh, the tailor shop, this na the now very famous uh, tailor, <laughs> tailor shop, <laughs> once upon a time in the Metcalf Mall, uh, yeah. the last store in the Metcalf yes. Mall, for those of you who've seen the movie, and for those of you who haven't, years. you have to see, the, see a Big yes. Sonia as the last tenant of the Metcalf Mall. Um, uh, and, and, and are you able to forget? Do you think about all this that's happened to you all the time? What do you tell your children? Well, you had to be very careful. Of course, we never realized. When I even watch the movie now, it's very difficult on me too, because you have to realize, now I realize even more, that the small children, they really understand more that you, that you think they do. They do, but they cannot, you know, express themselves, maybe. I only remember when it started asking me, Mom, what is that number you have here? You can imagine when the child asks you, what? I had to have a ready answer. So I would say to them, oh, this is a number because if mother gets lost, I didn't know what to say. <laughs> They'll be able to find me. <laughs> They'll be able to find me. That's all what I could think. But um, later on, when they were in, um, already in uh, high school, they started asking questions. And uh, really, I must tell you, they felt different even in school. Later on, I found out a lot of things. And especially when I watched the movie, I want you to know, I have to cry seeing my son, you know, breaking down. And uh, it was hard on them, they felt different. I can see now, I, matter of fact, I read a book, One Son of the Survivors. Right. And, he and said how the difficult same thing. It, is, it is for them. Yes. There, there, there also comes a moment, it seems to me, and the library was a little part of this, you, uh, and, and a number of other survivors in Kansas City, um, where, where the Winning. story, start, you start to tell the story in public, panels of, of of survivors, you were in the uh, the library w once doing that. Oh yeah. And and, uh, and 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 that experience seems to me to to have changed changed things not only for you but for for a lot of people and maybe for the community too. You know, helping all of us get in touch with with that experience, w witnessing as you did that experience for the rest of us. Absolutely, I must tell you, it was when I came out from this hell. I couldn't talk about it, and uh, they call it a guilt of survivors, survivor's guilt, and it's true. Our boys that come from the, you know, war, they go through this too. And in the beginning, I could not, I felt even guilty smiling. If something was funny, people were making, you know, jokes or anything. I have kept myself, how can I be here? One day, when I heard the denial, the skinheads on right. the radio, 
It was came like a thunder to my brain in saying, Sonia, this is the reason you survived. You have to start speaking up. How many of them did it before they died and they still had it, you know, and they tell us. If you will make it, tell the story, tell the real story to the world. But I can <laughs> So we, we have a great organization that you've worked with in Kansas City, the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education. I'm sure there are a number of people who are involved with it who are here tonight. And, and you go w with them, for them, and, and, and on your own to high schools and, and, and to... Absolutely. Various uh, you know, every place when they work, even I, I, I go to book clubs. <laughs> And uh, of course now, the last 10 years, um, uh, Regina comes with me because we have from our yeah, Midwest, you know, my wonderful a, daughter. A part of the team. Yes. <laughs> and um, I'm very proud of her, really. She's doing a wonderful job. The last 10 years, she's coming with me and she does the PowerPoint when I speak in the schools. And especially, I have to say to you that really my... Um, highest point is to speak to the future generation, to the students. My greatest, highest joy, when I receive from the students the letters and telling me, you've changed my life, please keep on speaking. It makes a difference when we see the real survivor than reading and seeing even movies. And this is my highest point because as you know, the bullying and all the hate, what's going on, I try to take out, I try to put love in their hearts, and they get it, yeah. and they get it. So I want to come back to uh, the high schoolers and, and, and the educational part, but there's also one other thing that you do that is really extraordinary, given that you lived your life for six years uh, at least in in what's probably the darkest prison environment in the history of mankind. And there, there's another organization in, in Kansas City called Reaching Out From Within that you've worked with. And you Sue go, Ellen, Sue yeah. Ellen Freed, her organization. Sue Ellen, in my uh, angel. Shout yeah. out to Sue Ellen and, and, and to her late husband, Harvey. Um, it, you go uh, with her at, into prisons in Kansas and talk to the long-term prisoners. Exactly. And, I mean, and what, an, what an extraordinary thing to do to talk about the kind of prison you were in to these exactly. prisoners. Exactly. And, and you know, I have to mention, you probably will laugh, when, when I came the first time in Lansing, you know, there are three stages, one, two, three, you know. And when I looked around and I saw they have Cokes and they have drinks, they sleep on mattresses, <laughs> and, and, and they can work out, you know, work a sport, and I said, my God. So when I start speaking, the first thing I said to them, you are not in a prison. You, <laughs> I said to them, you are in a hotel. <laughs> and really, they looked at me wildly. They really didn't understand until I started telling them my, you know, <laughs> what I went through. Sleeping on, uh, even in uh, Poland, in the prisons, they didn't sleep on mattresses. And uh, in the camp, we were just had, you know, straw bags, you know. So anyway, after speaking and telling him, they cried and they understood that uh, it gave them a lift and it, gave, and it gives them a lot of also will to, when they come out, to do something good too, to speak to the young people, not to make the mistakes what they did. So this is a very important thing. Well, it, I mean, also, a, women's, uh, by the way, women's prisons too were attended, right. yes. So, an, an extraordinary thing to do. I, mean, I think you have this incredible ability to uh, transcend uh, in your response to what happened to you and and to turn it into something that can help other people, which is ex extraordinary. I mean, Initiative. young people, but also the, the prisoners. I mean, it, your, your survival, it seems to me, 
it, and, and your ability to talk about it and to talk about what happened um, is gives gives all the rest of us hope. I hope so. I uh, hope so. You, in the in the dark in the darkest circumstances Dar yes. of, our, darkest, of our own yeah. lives. Um, I, I, I do. I do want to go back to the high school and and and, and get you to tell. There's a little story about uh, an eighth, originally an eighth grader, uh, a young lady named Carolyn Kennedy, not that Carolyn Kennedy, but our own yeah, local yeah, Carolyn yeah. Kennedy, uh, who was so inspired by uh, by what you had to to say. She said, I think that um, that th that you had a remarkable wisdom that you showed her that you, you made her feel like she was 45 years old. Uh, <laughs> had, had the, the wisdom, but she actually started an organization uh, to, 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 to yes, yeah. Bibi, Bibi joined too. Bibi came. My, my, my stepmother. <laughs> yes, yeah. She's part of, part of it too. Oh yes, she's well, delighted. I, I want I want to give the audience a, a chance to uh, to ask some questions, sure, but I, I do sure. want to say Absolutely. I think I speak for everybody in this room that your witness is an incredible witness, yeah. and and that the. We, we live in a time when there's a lot of hate in the world. Absolutely. And, and you give us love and hope that there can be more love. So thank as, you for yeah, that. As you can Sonia. see. <laughs> so I will mention, excuse me one moment. <laughs> Remember, please, propaganda is worse than bombs and anything. This is a brainwasher, and I'm trying also to tell the students, don't follow the crowd. Please, please educate yourself, and also especially read history. I would recommend this very highly to everybody, but especially to the students. It is just like a new window opens to the world, and you'll become a different person. History. and. Uh, I'm trying my best in my small way. I am very happy to see, like again, the letters that they tell me you changed my life. That's my highest point. Here, here. So if you, if you have a question, uh, would you come up to the microphone? We have two microphones at the end of uh, oh, sure. each, uh, each aisle. And short questions that are questions, please. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm going to have to make a quick statement to preface my question. It's going to be a movie coming out called The Last Battle, where a group of Vermont regular Army soldiers stopped a bunch of Texas National Guardsmen that were moving in about May 5th of 45. And he stopped him, he put up a white flag, he says, told the commander, who is a redneck from Texas, I hate to use that word, but it's descriptive. Anyway, he told him, he says, there's some SS guys that's gonna kill about 15, you know, inmates. The only way we can, I, can, I don't have enough men to stop them. If you'll join with me, we can go fight these guys and save these people. And so, as far as I know, that's the only case where American and Germans fought together. And they went to the castle, killed, or captured the SS, and saved the, the inmates. And that brings me to my question. As, and I've always wanted to ask this of a Holocaust survivor. Can, yeah. you, make, can you make a distinction, or is it, is it relevant or right to make a distinction between the Wehrmacht regular army and the SS? Is that, or are they all the same, or how do you see that? No. I mentioned before, it is a difference. But among the Wehrmacht, where some of them were there against Hitler. But the dirty work was the SS. Right. When they came in, they started. Because I have, you know, well, it's too long to tell you a coincidence which I'll never forget about one. He was a Hauptmann. And when they already had the, to march to the, uh, you know, to the war with uh, Russia, and by the way, I want to tell you, this comes only from me to think that we really have to be thankful to Almighty because if Hitler, in my opinion, it's my thoughts, if you would have started the war with Russia one month or two months ahead, he would have made it. Yeah. He forgotten yeah. the history about Napoleon. <laughs> Those... <laughs> Thanks God, 
I'm just mentioning because I can sit here hours and hours and talk to you, to my dear people. But, but you do feel a Wehrmacht, there, that is a legitimate distinction. I mean, that, it, do you that's think? right. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And there's no way we can repay you. But my pledge to you is to make sure I always vote to encourage everybody to get out there and vote. I believe Hitler won the first election by one vote. So it's important to everybody in this group here to make sure your vote counts. Sure. Really? Hi, Sonia. Uh, I, uh, I'm, it's my pleasure to meet you. My father, uh, I have looked at these pictures all of my life. This is Dachau. Dachau. My father uh, was, one, was uh, one of the soldiers at Free yes. Dachau. And uh, he never talked about it. And, uh, but we had these pictures at home since I've been, I looked at them since I'm four years old, since he came back from the you service. So uh, um, he, he said there was something that, uh, you know, the pictures don't show. He never did talk about it. I got his, he's in here, but, but the, uh, the smell was uh, yeah. something you Ex never exactly. forget. So. Thank you. You know, I don't, I'm not sure if Dachau had a uh, gas chamber. Yes. Did they? Yeah. I have, uh, well, I yeah. have the cream. Did. I don't know about, no, no. I, I don't know about, I don't have the gas chamber, but yeah. I got the crematorium. Yeah. I don't have pictures oh, of the gas chamber. Doesn't mean, because uh. Bergen Belsen also had only, right. yes, a crematoria. Doesn't mean they had a grand. No, you're right. I, I thought, don't have yeah, I knew, yes. Three. Because it was in Germany, yeah. I want to say, before you leave, I want to shake your hand. I want to hug you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, a lot of our young people, I'm sorry, they really don't know the real history of our heroes, of our young men when they fought in the World War II. I can tell you so much. And especially our wonderful, wonderful, you know, Eisenhower. He was one of a kind. There is too long to tell you things that you wouldn't believe it. He made it sure, you know, that uh, he, he made the journalists come in and see, and he made the, the Germans from the town come Correct. in and see. Yeah, and also from all the army yeah. to keep in the history because we humans, we have it, you know, we forget. He wanted to make for the history sure that each one of those, you know, like Patton and all of the big, you know, uh, in the army came to see all those dead bodies. Right. It is really, I'm, going, I'm telling you again, none of anyone who is alive to really visualize what in the 20th century could take, happen like this. Hi, Sonia. Uh, we watched your film at the Truman Library and we got to meet you and hug you and uh, I was bawling my eyes out just getting to hug you and she was crying a little bit as well. Um, I'm raising a very strong-minded, independent activist here and uh, <laughs> she is curious as to what she can do to get her friends to listen more um, to what she has to say and to listen more about the past that they will never be interested in because it's so far gone from her age range. How old is she? She's 10. 10. It's a little bit, you know, early. Because when we go to speak in the schools, we make sure they have to be 13, really, to, right. yes, to and face it. I understand it. that. She's she a little too young. She does not want this to go away. She does not want what has happened to be erased from people's oh, minds. And she tries not. to talk to people about it. and. They don't care to learn about history. And my 12-year-old son is the same way. He doesn't want to hear about the bad things in the world. Yes, it takes sometimes time. Sometimes it comes natural. With me, it came natural. Me and my brother were at history. Oh, you know, we knew. When our children were, like I say, in high school, I knew all about, you know, the history from other countries and so on and so on. So this is um, and the parents also have to encourage the children. And, uh, and I can tell you, there is a lot of things we can debate about it, because I spoke very also often in a juvenile delinquent place. So you can imagine, 
boys and girls from 10 to 16, 17. And I can assure you that some of them can be put back to the society. I know what I am saying, with the right help. Because a lot of those children, I always call the little babies when they come to this world, those are the little angels. That's what I believe. Those are the little angels. It's later on how the parents go mold them when they put the little fetus on this ground, and then it'll make a difference. If they will not receive any love, they pay a price for it. And really, it's too bad these days that many mothers have to, you know, work. But I, from my experience, can I, it's all right to say? Yeah. That <laughs> if you can stay with your baby, you are missing out something in your life, and it makes a big difference. No, nothing can replace the mother's love. This is the highest love in the world. The father loves them too, but it's a different love. So please remember, when you hold this baby, she knows that this is the mother. So if you can make it not to work and stay as long as possible, it will make a big difference. This is my opinion. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Sonia. Thank you very much for coming to talk to us, and I'm so sorry for what you had to go through. Um, my question is, as, as uh, you were a teenager, as, as this all started to happen, and as your parents and other families became aware that uh, they might possibly uh, be imprisoned or even worse, uh, what were some of the considerations that made people want to stay and that made families want to leave? Well, I tell you, everyone wants to come to the States, United States. Even with our problems, what we have, the whole world is now in problems. It is still the best country in the world, I want you to know. <laughs> Don't take it for granted. This is a country that I never would expect the, the wonderful, uh, the philanthropic, philanthropia, yes, really, yeah. and in this country. I think the American people are really good, wonderful people, and I, I hope that we still have good people in the more, in, uh, more good people in this world, otherwise it would collapse, I believe. And uh, your question was, I'm already getting mixed up. <laughs> it, uh, um, or how, I want to tell you, it was not easy even for us to come here. We had the Jewish organization, for example, would go to certain families, and they were the sponsors, and they would tell them, listen, we are taking them under our wings. You will not have anything to do with them. It's well enormously, okay? This is the way we came here. So really, the country did not have any problems with us. You follow me, yes? And some came because they had, you know, families here. And um, I believe the way it is in this world, we should be really a little more careful when to take in people, check out their backgrounds. If we will have time, I will tell you when I was, uh, <laughs> you know, we have time. how, we have how, time. how we this lady came, you know, and I testified. Okay, wait, tell, us the, tell us the story. I want to tell you a story. <laughs> it is very, very interesting because I mentioned to you in the beginning when I was in Maidanek, and there was one a vicious, more than vicious woman, you know, her name was Hermina Braunschweig, I still remember. One day, I hear a knock on my door, and I look out, and there are some two officers from the uh, um, FBI. And right away, they showed this to me, and I got scared. But they put right away smiles, and they, you know, like this. 
And they came into my house, let them in, and we were in the living room, they sit down, and uh, asked me if I am Sonia Warshawski. I said, yes, my maiden name is Greenstein, I was, you know. And um, they knew I was in Majdanek. And they were telling me the story about Hermina. You would not believe it. And they asked me if I remember her and all what she did. Of course, I, I told them if I closed my eyes, I could recognize her. And they told me that one day in New York, and, um, and let's see what was uh, the um, uh, place there, in a bakery, some of our women came there to buy, you know, some bread, whatever. And what do you think who is standing there selling the goods? Hermina herself. They did not make any noise. They didn't make you know, need to, for her to notice something. They went straight to FBI. And they were, you know, since she came, you know, lying. And how did she come? She married a GI. Right. Yes. She married a GI, and they had a right right away to, um, ex, how do you call it, ex, um, I, I to send her back send her to her Germany. Act, yeah. yeah, that's right. right. And they came especially to ask me if I will be called to be a witness. I said, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know how people come. And a lot of SS came to this country too. I got news for you. Yes. <laughs> this case is the best Yes, that's either. right. Yeah. So really don't uh, judge badly if you hear voices that we should be a little more careful whom we can take it in. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Miss Sonia, I'm very honored to speak with you. Um, I, uh, you're the only one who can answer this. Do you see a connection between our society now and our Americans and the Germans and the Jewish people as Hitler was rising to power. Uh, he didn't become so powerful immediately. It was a gradual process. And if the Germans and the Jewish people, with hindsight, could come and say to the Americans what they need to know in our times today, do you see a similarity in what's happening to our country and what happened to your country? Well, in my case, I would say it's completely, completely different. When, uh, when we came here, I, I came here to the United States, it was uh, also in May in uh, 1948. So it was a different America at that time, like times, you know, are changing all over the world. And um, I don't want to ever go into politics, I'll be honest with you, because I'm very disappointed in all of this. Instead to do something good for our people and uh, in the education area and so on and so on, I feel it's wasted time again, you know, hearings of the dirty things. And I mainly, mainly worry about our younger generation. Our language should be the high language. And sometimes on the radio even, they don't use the high, the high language. And I sometimes I very worry about our younger generation, what they are exposed to. So I don't know if I can answer really exactly what you asked me. But I, like I say again and again, that people with their born and raised here are taking for granted sometimes. It's still the best country. Even the haters, what they hate us, they want to come here. But one thing what I feel bad, and it comes from me, it's not politics, because they take advantage doing horrible things, you know, in, uh, because of our First Amendment. They're taking advantage on our First Amendment, beautiful amendment. And that's all what I feel. But this, I, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't go any farther. Well, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. 
Yes, sir. Hello, Sonia. Uh, it's good to see you again uh, in person. Um, my question actually is uh, it's something that I had kind of forgotten about until I saw it on Facebook earlier today, that we have, uh, here in this country, we have eight uh, white nationalists or actually people that belong to the not, uh, basically American Nazi party here in America that are running for U.S. government office. I don't know if you have an opinion on how to deal with them, I guess, to say the least, because, I mean, these are Holocaust deniers, which obviously is horrible for all of us uh, that are Jewish. But um, I don't know how, you know, if you have any recommendations on how we get the word out that these people, A, shouldn't be running, and B, you know, they should not be voted into office. I feel very wrong about it, because I tell you, we're all visiting this universe a very short time. And why the Almighty created darker people, yellow people, red people, whatever you want to call it, we're all the same. We should be treating each other just the same. You're here. Absolutely. <laughs> and we should help each other because really we all go on to the same thing. And in my opinion, personally, when you think about all religions, we're all winding up the same, you know, we know there is a higher power than we are, and we all call it God, really. Think about it. We're all brothers and sisters, doesn't make any difference. And again, if anyone will think that way, that we are only in a short time in this beautiful, beautiful universe, and maybe we ourselves will finish this beautiful universe. How many of us, we go out every day and we don't even, I mean, I, I love the nature and, and think about the sunshine and all of this. People mostly don't see it. It's mostly greed, power, and politics. And I don't like this. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Sonia, what a pleasure and honor to see you. And uh, my question is, because I think we love you, Thank um, you, because you are a very loving person, how were you able to love your enemies and how were you able to forgive them? Okay. You are not the only one asking this question. Even speaking in schools, some students will ask me, how can you talk to us about love after you experience this horrible, you know, life? And I tell him that I shall never forget, I shall, I have to, on this I'll have to explain to you, I shall never forgive, but I will never, never hate. If I'll hate, I destroy myself, and I become a hater myself. But to forgive, forgiveness has some borders. We have to be honest with ourselves. Forgiveness is a very important thing in a, every day of life. But talking about borders, how can I say me, myself, that I can forgive I would feel ashamed for those where they were dying and killed. And, and this has to come from a higher power, not from me. Amen. But do not hate. And I'll never hate. So these will be our last two uh, questions. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, Sonia. I'm 17 years old, and I'm getting ready to go into my senior year of high school, and I know that growing up is really difficult, and I wanted to know, like, what was your experience becoming a woman, but at the same time trying to survive and fight for your life every day, but you're still going through these daily changes of growing up and, like, learning how to live? Well, hope. Never lose hope. And main thing I believe is to believe in yourself. And then you get the power of it. Well, if you want to become something, you know, whatever in your life, you can achieve it. 
if you really put yourself to it. And um, I don't know what else I can say. Uh, <laughs> some people pray, whatever you know, you feel it makes you feel good. But uh, this is very important. Not to listen, somebody will tell you, oh, you will not be able to do it. No. If you feel it inside that you can, you will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Sonia, for coming and sharing with us your Thank story. You. I, yeah, very emotional. And also, I'd like to apologize um, and on part from this country. Hitler got his, was greatly inspired by President Andrew Jackson, who made known he's the one that passed the Indian Removal Act in the United States. And it was uh, basically swept under the rug of American history. Uh, people were removed from their homes uh, by United States soldiers. They were placed yeah. in camps and then they were marched from the southeastern part of the United States to Oklahoma. Uh, the Cherokee tribe, uh, 16,000 started, about 8,000 made it. They were marched, they were marched from the fall all the way into the spring. Uh, people were dying along the way. They were not allowed to bury their own people. They just had to keep moving. And there those that weren't removed, wound up living in the caves in, uh, like in Kentucky and West Virginia. Um, and I, like I say, I apologize because somebody who thought he had a great idea. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I'm getting to it. Thank you. Uh, yes, yes. But, uh, okay. so, and I guess in part you say you need to tell the story. Uh, history is aware of what happened, but not to the extent that of what really happened the, yes. to you yeah, and you're your right. people. Yes, yes. Uh, and what I'm and to do is I believe history needs to be told. The children need to, in the schools need to be taught true American history. Do you have any suggestions how this can be done? Um, you are asking me how we should um, encourage people to read the history? Did I end, get yeah, it? I, yeah. Yeah, I think she wants to know. This I, is a I, must. I think she's, in, in essence, already answered the question. We should all read history. We should do more of it Absolutely. in schools. We're not doing enough of it. We've taken history out of out of schools, replaced it with social social studies or STEM or whatever. It is really sad, you know. Even you know, you to pick up the Bible, you know, the Old Testament, New Testament, whatever. There were always wars. We had always wars, to be, you know, completely honest with you. And a lot of things were, was terrible, you know. This was history. But I feel from reading those things, the history, we should be getting better. We should change. This is what I say. So I, ho I hope you all will uh, uh, join me in thanking who I, one of the people I think is one of the most extraordinary people that I've ever met and, and in our community, Sonia Lachowski. Um, I thank you, all of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I love you. Love. I love you all.
I love you all and wish you all well and take care of your health. Remember, the most highest thing is your health. <laughs> it as the saying goes, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? But if I am only for myself, who am I? That means the Almighty wants us to take care of our body, of our health, to be able to help others. That's what I do. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.